This is Don Hollenbeck of General Meade's Union Army Headquarters, somewhere behind the lines near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The situation here on this third day of July, 1863, is grave indeed for the Union forces. Two Confederate attacks have been repulsed in two days of heavy fighting, but the northern casualties have been severe. The Union line is badly shaken, and there's serious concern as to whether it can successfully withstand the next attack that's expected at any minute from the crack Confederate troops of General Lee. And for the last two years, they've yet to lose a single battle in this war between the states. General George Gordon Meade at a news conference held a few moments ago announced... Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. CBS is there. Lee before Gettysburg, the high tide of the Confederacy. CBS asks you to imagine that our microphone is present at this decisive battle of the war between the states, between the North and the South, between the Union forces and the Confederates. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. This broadcast, produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical facts and quotations. And now, Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863... And Don Holland Holland this afternoon at Field Army Headquarters is one of tension and suspense. This is the most serious moment of the war between the states. The next few hours will tell whether or not the Confederate tide can be checked. If Meade fails to hold Lee here at Gettysburg this afternoon, the nation's capital will be at the mercy of the victorious Confederate troops. President Lincoln will be under increased pressure to accept the Confederate demands for peace. At this very moment, according to CBS reports from Washington, the Vice President of the Confederacy, Mr. Alexander Stevens, is now at Fortress Monroe in Chesapeake Bay under a flag of truce awaiting to be received by President Lincoln. If Meade's army is defeated here today on the soil of Pennsylvania, there may be many more who will say that the war is hopeless, that the North had better make peace with the South. And that would mean a nation permanently divided. It would mean the dissolution of the Union. That is why military experts here at Gettysburg are convinced that this battle may be the turning point of the war. And here to weigh the possibilities of the situation is our own CBS military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. It is now ten minutes of one. There has been an ominous silence over this Gettysburg battlefield since eleven o'clock this morning. Then General Slocum's Union Corps regained its position on Culp's Hill, the right anchor of the Union line. However... General George G. Meade, the Union Army commander, has not been deluded by this local success. He knows that General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate commander, has yet to throw the full might of his forces into a final attack. I am convinced, on this third day of battle, that the attack will not come at the round tops, the left anchor of the Union line. For good reasons. For 20,000 reasons. 20,000 dead and wounded Confederate and Union soldiers. I saw them fall in yesterday's violent fighting in a peach orchard, on a wheat field, when the Confederates under General Longstreet attacked the Union Third Corps under General Sickles. Also, I am reasonably sure that the Confederate attack will not be directed against the right flank of the Union line at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. And here's why. The Confederates under Generals A.P. Hill and Ewell attacked there last night, and although they took a heavy toll in northern casualties, they were beaten back by the troops under Union Generals Slocum and Howard. The only point of the Union line that the Confederates have yet to test is the center under General Hancock, and that's where I think the attack will come this afternoon. Major General George Gordon Meade has been in command of the Union Army of the Potomac for only five days. He is in a tight spot. I talked to him last night after a council of war at his headquarters. He admits that he is somewhat superior in numbers. He is far better off as regards supplies. His army is in good spirits under his leadership. He holds a strong position. But the Confederate troops here at Gettysburg are flushed with an unbroken string of victories. The, these men of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia have never been defeated. They believe they can do anything, and they are determined to smash this Union Army this afternoon, claim it as perhaps their final victim, and end this war. Confederate artillery has just come out of the woods opposite the center of the Union front. We have our CBS reporter right there. So go ahead, John Daly. Go ahead, Daly. Ten Confederate guns have been wheeled into position in front of me and a little bit to the left. From this distance, it's hard to tell whether they're trained here at the center or farther over on the line. The guns were brought out just a few moments ago, but the Confederates who brought them out have disappeared back into the woods, taking their horses with them, leaving the guns as far as we can see unattended. 
General Hunt, the Northern Artillery Commander, standing behind me here on the ridge, is examining the Confederate pieces through his field glasses and giving orders to his aides. It may be that the general will move up more Union artillery, although I don't see how that's possible. For Cemetery Ridge, here in plain view of the Confederates a mile away, is lined with northern cannon almost wheel to wheel. There are over 80 guns on this ridge. There's no secret about it. The Confederates can certainly see them and can count them. Still no sign of any artillerymen around those Confederate cannon. Whether this means an immediate shelling, the beginning of the attack that we're expecting and waiting for, we just don't know. While we wait for the Confederates to make up their minds about those cannon over there, I want you to meet two privates from the Union ranks. First, Private John Burns, citizen volunteer, native of Gettysburg, cobbler by trade, and 72 years old. That's right, isn't it, Private Burns? Yeah. Private Burns has snow-white hair, deep-set eyes, three bandages, one on each arm, one on his left leg. You told me a while ago, Private Burns, that you got those wounds in the first day's fighting. Is that right? Yeah. Did you get them all at once? No. Private Burns is modest. The fact is, he's a veteran of the War of 1812. He's got a farm here at Gettysburg. And when the Confederates came, he got his old musket and powder horn and joined up with the famous Wisconsin Iron Brigade. In the fighting that followed, Burns was wounded in the right arm, taken to the rear, and his wound was dressed. He returned immediately to the front and was wounded in the other arm. He was taken to the rear again. His second wound was dressed, but he came back and was wounded a third time, this time in the left leg. But even that didn't stop him because here he is with his rifle in his hand, waiting to see what those Confederate cannon over there in the distance are going to do. Right, Private Burns? Yeah. Well, don't you think you've done enough fighting for one man, Private Burns, especially for a man of your age? Don't you think that... Perhaps... mister, don't start telling me where I belong. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way, Burns. Well, then, why don't you say what you mean? All right, I will. I'd like to know why you volunteered. They took my cow. Ain't got no right taking my cow. Is that the only reason you are fighting this war for... My cow? One reason, mister. It's a good one, ain't it? Well, what are some of the others? I'm a farmer and a cobbler. I've lived on this little piece I got here for over 70 years. I'm not too old to work it, and I'm not too old to defend it. And, mister, I don't know whether you know this either, but if we lose this battle today, I not only lose my cow and my piece of property, but we lose the Union. We lose this country. And that's something I fought for in 1812, and I'm fighting for it again. Thank you, Private Burns. It looks as though you're going to get a chance to do some more fighting this afternoon. There's still no sign of Confederate artillerymen around those cannon over here. Over there, rather. And here's another Union soldier, Private Tom McGaw. He's tall and lanky, with freckles and a mess of red hair shooting out from under a blue cap. Well, what do you think about those Confederate cannon over there, Private? What do you think it means? I don't know. Well, how old are you, Private McGaw? Eighteen. Well, would you speak just a little bit louder, please? Uh... Eighteen. Eighteen. Well, I understand that that's the average age of half the Union Army here today, Tom. It seems awful young, doesn't it? Oh, I don't know. Well, why are there so many young ones like you here? Well, uh, after the Battle of Chancellorsville, of course, the older fellow's time was up, so so they went home. Oh, I see. And then uh, youngsters like you volunteered to fill the ranks. No, sir. I was drafted. Well, where are you from, Tom? Illinois country. And what were you doing when you were drafted? Oh, working in my dad's store. Are you married? Well, what are you blushing about? Have you got a sweetheart? Oh, I guess so. Does she write to you? Oh, about every two weeks. And who do you miss the most? Your mother or your sweetheart? You miss them both, don't you? Yes, sir. Well, how do you like the hey, army, Tom? Oh, excuse me, Tom. The Confederates are moving more artillery out of the woods into the open position beyond the Emmitsburg Road, which runs diagonally through the battlefield. I can't see what's going on very well, because the guns are too far to my left, and the Kadori house out there in the middle of the battlefield is blocking my line of vision. But Jackson Beck, who's over on Big Round Top, two miles to my left, can see them better. So over to Jackson Beck. Seventy-five guns. Good it job. looks like the whole works this time, John. I'd say about Watch 75 guns on good ground, ground over on my right. They're uh, moving them along the Emmitsburg Road from the Peach Orchard northward for about 1,300 yards. Some of the cannon are as close as six or 700 yards from the northern lines. The Confederates are beginning to point the guns, most of them are Parrots and Napoleons, toward the center of the Union line. Uh, in some of the interviews I've had here with the veteran Union officers, 
They say that they cannot recall such an unusually heavy concentration of Confederate artillery at any one point. Now, there's no telling how many more guns are screened in those woods further down to the center and on past the center and all up and down that long Confederate line. Now, looking through my glasses from here, I can see that once again, as before, the Confederate artillerymen have taken their horses back into the woods. The guns are unmanned, but we're not forgetting that they can be fired at a moment's notice. All the cannoneers have to do is run out of the woods and let go. But Ken Roberts, over at the far right of the Union line, has news of cavalry action, so over to Ken Roberts. I've just received a report that a heavy force of Confederate cavalry has ridden far around and behind this right flank of the Union army, and at this moment has been intercepted and engaged by Union cavalry under Generals Kilpatrick and Gregg. It is almost certain that this surprise cavalry movement is a part of the Confederate tactics now shaping up rapidly. In other words, while the Confederate cavalry, presumably under General Stewart, is trying to turn the right flank of the Union army, the main Confederate attack will try to break through its center. We haven't heard the Confederate artillery open fire yet. We have no news about the progress of the cavalry engagement, but we expect to hear in a moment or two. And while we're waiting, by special permission of Union General Howard, and with the consent of the man himself, I'm going to let you hear from a Confederate prisoner of war taken in the action on Copes Hill early this morning. He's a huge, brawny man, about six feet tall, dark, sunburned, heavy, bushy beard. He's wearing reddish homespun pants, shirt, a broad-brimmed wool hat, and brand-new shoes. That's right. What shoes I ever had since this year war started. Where'd you get them? Over yonder. Gettysburg day before yesterday and we kicked the daylights out of the Yankees and threw them out of town. Well, do you think you'll enjoy wearing those shoes in some northern prison camp? Northern prison camp? Man, where you been this war? Don't you know Mark Roberts gonna bust this Yankee line wide open this afternoon and take me to Washington with him? You're pretty confident, aren't you? Well, sure. You remember what Mark Roberts did to the Yankees in Manassas? Remember what he did at Sharpsburg? You mean Antietam, don't you? No, sir, I mean Sharpsburg. And Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville? Ha! Every time he was outnumbered two to one. Every time we railed him. <laughs> you trying to tell me that today's going to be any different? <laughs> well, how about those new Spencer carbines the Yankee cavalry had here at Gettysburg? They're the first repeaters ever used in this war. They shoot eight times and yours only shoot once. Yeah. We know how to aim, boy. <laughs> Then uh, you don't think much of the Yanks as fighters. Well, I suppose they'd fight pretty good if they didn't have to tote such big loads. You know, they're in the toting business. They ain't in the fighting business. <laughs> Man alive, I don't see how they can move with all that stuff on their back. <laughs> I, uh, I forgot to ask your name, soldier. Where are you from? Jim Crocker. I'm from Mississippi. Well, if you're so certain of winning, maybe you'd like to tell us where General Lee is going to attack this afternoon. What's the matter, boy? You you scared, huh? You stick with me. I'll be scared. <laughs> well, I don't think you're going to laugh at this. This note that's just been handed to me says that your General Stewart's cavalry has been repulsed behind the Union lines and is riding back to the Confederate lines as fast as it can. That ain't got nothing to do with the cannon up yonder. That's where the Yanks are going to get it. Well, nothing's happened yet. Hey, There's hey, 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 a cutter hey, shot. Hey, hey, two miles hey, 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 There's another one. Same direction. I can't see it to the center of the line out of my range of view. So over to John Daly. The Confederate artillerymen are swarming around their guns in plain sight of our position behind the little top of three. They've opened fire with fast guns. The Confederates are firing on us. The shells screaming right over our heads. The horses around us are wearing up. They're neighing in sight. One of them is running the away. He's galloping past me out of the battlefield. Fire splinters and shells are flying through the air on this bridge just behind me. Artillerymen are falling. Hearts and iron axles, poles and wheels are snapping like straws. Caissons are being blasted to death. The infantry out in front of you is huddled behind the stone wall. They're digging in behind every rock, crunching into every ditch. They're hugging this ground just as I am for dear life itself. The shouts of the Union guns are lifting. They're feeling out the range. They'll be coming loose in just a minute, I hope. The whole Confederate line running along Seminary Ridge, one mile across from me, has opened up. It's getting very hot here. I don't know how much longer I can stay on the air. A Union face on behind me is just exploded. I've never heard such a cannonade as this.
This is Don Hollenbeck at Union Headquarters behind the lines. We've lost contact with John Daly at the center of the line. We'll switch you now to Jackson Beck at Big Round Top, two miles to the left of Daly. Come in, Beck. Jackson Beck on Big Round Top. Through my glasses from my perch way up here, I can see the Confederate guns firing and their shells falling at the center of the Union line. Now there goes the Union artillery blazing out in answer to the Confederates. The entire Union line, for two miles, from my vicinity to Cemetery Hill, has opened up in full force. Smoke on both sides is thickening, rolling across the battlefield, beginning to converge in one big black canopy, flanking out the sun. It's probably difficult to see anything from up here, but through the smoke I can hear and see roars and flashes of flame as the shells find their marks again and again, including caissons, blowing up batteries. Uh, the casualties on both sides must be enormous. This is the greatest artillery duel I've ever seen in this war. There must be at least 180 guns firing at each other, a tremendous concentration of artillery. The uh, Northerners are concentrating on the Confederate artillery, but the Confederate guns are not only going after the Union artillery up there on the ridge, they're throwing their shells over and to the rear of the Union line. The fire is unusually heavy must be directed either against the Union Reserve or possibly even at the headquarters. Uh, we haven't heard from them. Let's have a report from there. Go ahead, Don Hollenbeck. This is Don Hollenbeck at Union headquarters behind the lines. General Meade nearly escaped death a few moments ago when a Confederate shell exploded here and killed one of his aides. The general and his staff have ridden farther behind the lines out of range of the Confederate fire. Now the northern fire has stopped. I don't know whether it's been knocked out or what. But the Confederate fire is still going. This little whitewashed farmhouse is still taking a heavy Confederate fire. The shells are exploding all around. The fire is especially heavy. Now the Confederate fire is stopping. I don't know what this means. The damage at Union headquarters is terrific. It must be an awful shambles in the center of the northern line. We've been trying to make contact again with John Daly, but we haven't been able to since the start of the cannonade. So we'll switch you again to Jackson Beck on Big Round Top to see what's happening. Go ahead, Beck. This is Jackson Beck. Something is going on. It's going on over on Seminary Ridge in the woods up there. Now, through my glasses, I can see the... This is Don Hollenbeck at Union Headquarters. We've just established contact again with John Daly at the center of the Union line. Go ahead, John Daly. The Confederate infantry has come out of the woods one mile across from me. Thousands of them. Now they've halted. They're dressing the line right and left. It's at least three quarters of a mile long, a straight line of men in butternut and gray. Their rifles are at right shoulder as if on parade. Their battle flags are coming out now, coming out of those woods. Five, six, seven, ten, there must be at least plenty of them up and down that line. They're red deepened by the sun. Up here on the ridge, Union Reserve artillery is pulling into position. Through my glasses, I can make out among those flags the 14th, the 18th, the 19th, the 57th Virginians. They belong to General Pickett's Virginia Division. I remember seeing those same blood-red banners at Fredericksburg. There's the 22nd and 34th North Carolina. They must be under General Pettigrew. There comes the 1st and the 14th Tennessee. Troops from Alabama and Mississippi also, and many more. I believe some of them are under General Trimble. It looks like the Confederates are going to charge under Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble. Many of the Confederates are wearing blood-stained bandages, but still they keep coming. A second line has come out of the woods forming behind that first one. The first gray line hasn't moved yet. It's still dressing its formation. And all of this in the full view of the Union line, three quarters of a mile away. There must be at least 10,000 Confederate soldiers over there now. And there comes some more. A third line is coming out of the woods. 5,000 more. I'm still using my glasses. I can see a Confederate officer on a big black horse riding up and down in front of that first line. He's wearing a blue overcoat in this hot July sun. I think it's Garnet of Virginia. There are four more officers on horseback coming out in front of that long gray line. Swords drawn. Other officers are on foot. The Union artillery reserves are ready. The infantry behind the wall in front of me is tense and expectant and strangely silent. Through my glasses, I can see another Confederate officer. He's on horseback. He's placed his hat on the tip of his sword. He's pointing it at this direction, and he's shouting to his men. It must be the signal to advance. Yes, it is. That dull gray line is moving forward. Marching, marching, common time, common time, arms at right shoulder, perfect formation, an ocean of men on parade, 
regiment after regiment, brigade after brigade. Their glittering muskets look like a solid mass of steel. They move with the regularity of a, of a, of a pendulum. This is incredible and magnificent. Lee's proudest, finest bearded veterans, some in uniform, many of them in civilian clothes, straw hats, caps, aristocrats and barefooted mountaineers, the flower of the South, men who glory in close fighting. They're marching now with unbelievable confidence, and they're headed right up here. The Confederates are, well, perhaps a, a little more than a half a mile away now. They're still in perfect formation, except that each flank appears to be gradually closing in converging towards this clump of trees where I'm standing. It looks like they mean to hurl 15,000 men right at this point of the Union line. I just can't believe it. Not a shot has been fired on either side yet, and that gray line is still coming on. Their long line is getting narrower and deeper. It's pushing over fences in their way, striding through fields of wheat, stubble and tall grass. It's nearer and nearer to the Emmitsburg Road, which is just about in the middle of the battlefield. 200 yards, those Confederates have marched, and not a shot fired. Why don't the northern guns up here open up? Why don't they shoot? Ah! Why don't they Jackson Beck at Big Round Top. Through my glasses, I can see those Confederates about two miles up to my right. They're charging hard. They're charging toward the center of the line now where John Daly was. They're charging straight at the center of the Union line with cold steel. Now the Union infantry has opened up. A flash of flame and a roar, and they're playing havoc with the charging Confederate lines. I see a mounted Confederate officer waving his men forward. Now, through my glasses at two miles, it's difficult to see clearly over the tails of this action, but I'll try and give you as much as I can. It's impossible to describe everything that's going on up there. Too much is happening. That Confederate officer on the horse is down, and the horse is racing back to the Confederate line. There goes another Confederate officer blasted off his horse. Now a third one is down, but he's back on his feet. It's the man with the hat on the point of his sword. I can see him pointing his sword at the Union line. It's odd how one little man with a hat on his sword can center your attention, but it's the only way I can trace the tie of the battle. There goes the first Confederate volley from at least 5,000 rifles. The Northern infantry, Northern infantry seems to be wavering. Cannoneers behind them must have been cut the ribbons by this murderous Confederate fire. The smoke and the dust of the fighting makes it awfully hard to tell exactly what's happening up there now, but they should be getting courier reports back at Meade's headquarters. Hollenbeck, Don Hollenbeck, can you hear me? Yes, Jack, yes, go ahead. Are you getting any reports from the battle? That's right, couriers are coming down here all the time, but so far we don't know much more than you can see from Roundtop. The fire's terrible. We can only guess how bad it is for the wounded coming in. We've just had a courier report that the first line has been hit hard. Can you see anything, Jack? The uh, Union infantry is falling back. The Union line is breaking. Where I can see the line, the blue-coated men are running back. About 5,000 Confederates have stormed the ridge. They've broken the Union line. The ridge is there. Now they're taking cover behind the Union stone wall. Through my glasses, I can see that Confederate officer with his hat on his sword standing on the wall up there. He's urging his men to follow him. There they go, about 100. They're swarming over the Union guns. Now they're, they're, they're turning them around. They're turning the guns around. They're going to fire on the Northerners with their own guns. Now... The Union infantry is rallying. They seem to be reforming. The Northerners are firing volley after volley at the Confederate sent the gun. 
and the Confederates are going down. They're being blasted down by the Northern Rifles. There goes that gallant Confederate officer. He's down. Down, his body is draped over a gun. That broken Union line has reformed. It has reorganized. Now it's charging back to retake that part of the line. The only part that gave way in the charge. The Confederates see them coming. They're pushing madly into an angle of the stone wall, which I can't see from here. Hollenbeck, do you have any reports at headquarters? Yes, Jack. A courier just came in from General Gibbon, and the spearhead of that Confederate charge looks like it's been broken. That's the way we see it here. But the Confederates are still attacking in an angle, that angle to the right of that little clump of trees. Can you see how they're making out in there? Well, the, the Union cannon have stopped firing, but it's tough to see what's going on. Such a mass of men, arms, smoke, and fire, swords, and butts of guns. Through my glasses, it's plain that men are falling at every step. In that angle of that stone wall, it's a bloody angle now. The Confederate color sergeant is using his flag staff as a club. The Confederates are crowding around their battle flags. Flags that waved so proudly took a short time before, and they're now being cut down one by one. The Northerners are closing in on the right, left, and in front. Those Confederates are in a death trap. They're lost unless they can get reinforcements right away. Now, through my glasses over there, I can see those Confederate reinforcements, but they're going the wrong way. They can't see their objective because of the smoke of battle. Now, back up in the center of the Union line, the Northerners are stepping up that brutal rifle fire from three sides. Now, it looks like the Confederates are wavering. They are wavering. Jack, Jack, Beck. John Daly's back in the center of the line. Let's give it to him. Go ahead, John Daly. Surrendering, throwing down their guns and their swords was the only thing they could do. No human being could stand up under such fire. In front of me is the body of the gallant Confederate officer who led that charge over the stone wall that advanced further into the Union line than any other Confederate. His body is hanging over a Union cannon, left hand on the barrel, his right hand still grasping his sword, his gray hat clean up to the hilt. He is one of what must be at least 10,000 Confederates who were either killed, wounded, or taken prisoner in the fighting here today. Oh, the cheer! It's for General Meade. Here comes the Northern Commander, General Meade. He's riding fast down the federal line to my right. The roar you're hearing is the entire Union line standing up and saluting him with a cheer. I'll try to get to him as he passes. He's dressed in his familiar summer uniform of dark blue without badge or ornament, except for the shoulder stripes of his braid and the light straight sword. His hat is thrust over his bearded white face. Here he comes now. General Meade. General Meade. General, sir, will you say a word? The is ours. Thank God. Louis will say. It's victory. Victory for the North. Unbelievable victory on the very brink of defeat. General George Gordon Meade, the commander-in-chief of the Union Army, has just declared that today, July 3rd, 1863, Lee has been stopped... Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. Pickett's gallant charge failed, and the high tide of the Confederacy... Is over. You have been listening to The Battle of Gettysburg, another broadcast in the series CBS Is There, produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Louis Sheon. The Battle of Gettysburg was written by McKay Duran and Robert Louis Sheon. Next week, Athens, 399 B.C., the death of Socrates. CBS Is There. Monday, October 27th, is Navy Day. Each year, one day is set aside to pay tribute to the accomplishment of United States naval establishments, including the Marine Corps. Open house programs are scheduled to all major naval bases and airfields. The public is invited to visit warships of the fleet at various ports. There will be public observances throughout the nation, and a hats-off salute to our Navy and its fine record in our country's history. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.